And Jeremiah is going to be called to be a special prophet. But he's not sure if he wants to call or not. Well, let me begin just a little different then. Have you ever had a nightmare? A dream where you wake up and you ask yourself, was that real? Well, psychologists tell us that almost everyone has one sooner or later. And the most common nightmare is that of failing a test, of not accomplishing what we wanted to do somehow. Waking up and finding the words on the page are no longer in English, but in another language we don't know. Or maybe we get to the test site, but we're a day late. All those kinds of things happen to people, psychologists tell us, all over the world. Well, I don't think Jeremiah would say he had a nightmare, but he wasn't quite sure what was happening when Jesus spoke to him. Now, a lot of people would say, if Jesus was to speak to me, I'd go with it. If he were to speak to me, I'd be ready. But you know what? As we look in Scripture, most of the time when God has spoken to someone, they've either made excuses, tried to, uh, you know, excuse themselves, wonder about it, deny it, and the like. And so here's Jeremiah. He's no different than most of us would be if we heard from God directly. He says, I'm too young. I can't talk. I can't, I can't, I can't. You see, Jeremiah wasn't listening to all of the words that Jesus gave, or that God gave to him that day. He heard only about, you're going to go. You're going to speak. He didn't hear the words that are so important in this section. Jeremiah, before you were born, when you were being knit together in the womb, I consecrated you. I called you. I set you apart. The first thing that we want to see when we come to this Jeremiah passage is that God's people are called people. We have different callings. We have different opportunities. But we are all called to be a part of God's plan. We have a purpose. Now, many people go through life purposeless, meaningless, and they wonder what it's all for. In fact, so many of those, or many, many people are feeling that way that the rise of suicides in our nation is, is tremendous. But we have a purpose, and we are part of a plan, God's plan. The first thing we need to understand from Jeremiah's story then is that God made you for a purpose. He set you apart and you have things to do for God. Dr. Robert Schuller, the famous uh, preacher who talked about possibility thinking, had an interesting practice each morning in his life. Every morning he would pray this prayer. Dear Lord, lead me to the person you want to speak to through my life today. Lead me to the person you want to speak to through my life today. Schuler said that when he considered that, then every person he met every day mattered. They were people that God may, wanted, may have wanted him to speak to. And in so doing, God would reveal his plan for that person. Now, he didn't say he knew all the answers. But he did say he knew he was called to make a witness. And to let God's love flow through him. What a difference it would make in our lives. If we viewed every moment... Every situation, every person, as a prospective person God was going to talk to through your life. Well, 
Paul writes about this very thing hundreds of years later from Jeremiah. In Ephesians 2, Paul writes, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which we were prepared for in advance. Did you hear that? The good works were prepared for us in advance. Even before our birth, God was already planning to make use of us in his kingdom. He would call us to faith. He would touch our hearts so that we could touch the hearts of others. Next, not only do we have a purpose, not only do we have a plan, not only do we have advanced things to do, but we can do so fearlessly. Fear that we can't do the job, that we aren't qualified, is what Jeremiah said. I'm too young. I don't have the way to speak. But to the those whom God calls, he qualifies. To those that he appoints, he anoints. We are chosen and anointed to be his people. That we might live in a way that lets everyone know that man, that woman, that child walks fearlessly through life because God is with him. A family was at a park, a national park. They liked to hike, they liked to climb mountains and things like that. And they were all there together. Two of the boys got ahead and climbed up out on a ledge. But they got on the ledge and realized they didn't know how to get back down. Eventually, they found a way to get back down safely. But their father had a talk with them later that afternoon. He said, you've got two things you need to remember if you're rock climbing. Be sure you know where you'll land if you jump. And second, be sure you have a way back down before you go higher up. Well, those are good words for rock climbers, but there aren't, they aren't good words for you and me. Because God calls us to jump, to live fearlessly, because he will catch us. He will be with us once again. To those he calls, he qualifies. To those he appoints, he anoints. To Jeremiah, he not only says, you are going to be my prophet, but I am going to be with you. I will rescue you. When you speak to the nations, you'll be speaking my words. And they will have power. So we need to lead our lives fearlessly. Not recklessly, but fearlessly. Knowing that God is with us. That we walk hand in hand with him. Deborah Constain grew up in Los Angeles. She didn't have a very good home life. She did drugs. She dropped out of school. And yet she rose in the ranks of the company she worked for to become vice president of the real estate company she worked for. But she always thought she would be, it would be nice to be doing more. She liked her job. She had progressed well, even though she had a poor beginning. She was talking one day to one of her fellow workers. Now, part of her job as vice president of this real estate company was to also kind of head up their community awareness, their philanthropic ideas and events. And so she, wanting to do what she spoke about, gave time to work in a, in a, in a center for children who had no place to go after school. But it just kind of always grated on her that there were so many children who could use this kind of place and so few places for them to go. She was talking about that to one of her co-workers. And she said, I really feel like, like I'm being called to do this volunteer work full time. Her friend said, then go. You don't understand, it's a big job. And she began to make excuses why she couldn't do it. He looked at her and said, 
You've been good at your job here. You can get things done. Go. You can do it. She left her regular job that day to take up the calling to be a worker for children after school. And she put together a new organization called A Place Called Home. And it became a place for children to come after school where they wouldn't be out on the streets, where they wouldn't be getting into trouble, but where they would receive encouragement, tutoring, all kinds of skills and activities. Who knows what you and I can do if we'll live fearlessly, but dependently holding on to our Lord. Lastly, not only are we called for a purpose and called to live fearlessly, we are also called to be aware that this is all part of God's plan. We can trust that what God calls into being, he will be with. And yes, even before we were born, the plan of salvation was in place. Wow. We can trust in him. We can be assured that we walk with him in our daily walk here on this planet. And that also, he goes to prepare a place for us that where he is in eternity, we will one day be also. That's all part of God's plan. To call us to a purpose, to energize us to live fearlessly, and to trust that he will always be at our side. Do we have any football people here today? Anybody who follows the games? Well, if you watch football at all, you'll notice from time to time that they throw passes. They throw that football down the field, and when they get ready to throw it down the field, the receiver is running. The ball is thrown and the receiver hopefully runs underneath it. It's called a lead pass, a leading pass. Well, God calls us and he throws the ball, but he throws it knowing that where we are, he will be also. Now, if you ever had a chance to play catch football with some of the leading quarterbacks of our day, like Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers or Pat Mahomes, and they told you to go out for a pass, you would go and you would keep running because, well, these are people who have won Super Bowls. They have a ring to prove their ability. Well, God doesn't have a ring to prove his trustworthiness. He has a cross. And on that cross, his son died. And that's our symbol of faith and trust, that on that cross, the sins of the world were paid for all time. And today, when we come to the Lord's table, we are assured that our sins have been forgiven, that we are washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. But while we are washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, God doesn't call us to be lambs. But he calls us to be lions, to live our faith boldly and fearlessly because he's calling us and he's prepared the work for us to do. So let's take each step by faith, knowing we're called, knowing that we are reassured and that we can trust him for he who began the good work in you will bring it to completion. Amen.